Hey everyone, so it's time for more R programming with Intro to R. So I hope you're excited and ready uh, for additional content on R. Uh, so today we're moving on to unit two to the course, which is less about basic skills and more about basic data, anal data analysis. So this is moving from, you know, how do you use R as a calculator? How do you, you know, what are data types? What are special values? Stuff like that. And more in, you have a data set and now you need to load it up and do some analyses with it, do some visualizations with it, stuff like this. Uh, so that's going to be the main focus is not only coding that, but also how to make that uh, analysis reproducible. Um, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about basic plotting, but also using R Markdown because R Markdown is a great way to do what's called literate programming programming, which we'll talk about uh, right now. So what is literate programming? Um, so uh, one of the basic tenets of science is that work is reproducible. Uh, this applies to code as well, turns out. Um, we talk more about how to accomplish this in the next unit, but for now we're going to focus on documentation and literate programming to build reproducible analyses. So what does this mean? What is documentation? Code documentation refers to all the notes, instructions, and comments provided uh, that provide a context and help a user, uh, you know, you and other people, um, you after you know a couple months of not looking at it, uh, run the code successfully. Um, uh, so that's all really important. Uh, but what we're going to focus on today is is called literate programming. And literate programming is a method of directly embedding chunks of code in documentation that helps the user un understand what the code and its output. So it's really putting all of that code and all of the outputs of that code in context with the documentation or the write up about why you're doing the code, what you're doing exactly, and what it all means. Okay, so this is a great way of kind of um, uh, getting around that repro uh, the the thing that often happens to people where we they write code they do an analysis uh, they come back to it three months later without any notes in then they can't remember so uh, you have to go back and we'll step through what your thought processes were about it which don't always make sense to you even after a short period of time uh, but for a user it's it's almost almost impossible it's a, it's a lot of work it's a lot of trying to guess what uh, the original programmer intended and things like this with literary coding it gets around a lot of that stuff because you have a way to to sort of write a human readable document not just comments in a code um, package or a code script um, and also embed uh, the output of code directly into that document so it's it's a really nice way of doing it and so this is how we're going to do it from now on um, our markdown, we use this as sort of a laboratory notebook for code. So if you have done a lab before, like a, a, a pen and paper sort of lab with a, a bound lab notebook, you'll write some stuff down, you'll write, you know, what you've done and the steps and the protocol and then the results, you'll put notes, you'll even, you know, plot out stuff uh, by hand if you have a, a graph that you need to make and all of that stuff. It's essentially the same with our markdown. Our markdown documents gives you the ability to bed your code into a regular readable document so that you can um, make your analyses reproducible and also just put it in a context that's actually helpful for you um, while also making it reproducible. So it puts it in context, but it also has this reproducible environment so that you, when you hit um, knit or you hit preview, it's actually running the entire script with the original data, producing that code and producing that figure um, uh, as as uh, uh, an uh, entire analysis, so you don't have to remember writing it up on a Word document or or some other type of document, and then thinking, oh well, you know, I used this version. Was that the the most latest version of that that uh, image file of the analysis or the graph, or was it, or have I updated it? I forgot to update it. Uh, I can't remember. You know, you don't need to do that because you hit preview and everything automatically updates for you. Um, our markdown with our projects, again, our projects are something uh, specific to our studio that help you organize data and code into a neat little package, which is really great if you need to, to, to go and rerun somebody's code or grade it or something like that. Um, 
but our projects are, are also going to automatically set the working directory for you so you don't have to worry about it really nice our projects will also keep track of the work that you do in a specific project so it doesn't get mixed up with other projects this is really helpful too even in the terms of history you can see that i've done a lot of just stuff in this history um, in a new project that's going to be wiped out you're only going to have the history of working on that specific project so it, it, it's really helpful for keeping track of a lot of work that you're doing especially if you're using our um, studio for for separate separate projects which i definitely do it's very very helpful so let's go ahead and get started by creating a new r project so what i want you to do is i want you to in the upper left hand co corner right here you're going to see a project and it should say none i don't think anybody should be working on a project here um, but you're going to click on that and start new project okay um uh, you're going to get another project wizard pop up and you're going to select new directory Okay, and another window that pops up and you're going to select new project. Now there's all sorts of other things that you can do. This is really, really cool. Um, and I encourage you to, to, to you know, uh, explore all of these options on your own. But right now we're just going to do a new project. Uh, you should get uh, yet another window. This is your last one. And so you want to create a directory name. Okay, so the directory name can be my first project. It can be literally anything. You don't have to name it the same, but you can also name it the same and browse. So now I want you to put it in a place that makes sense to you. Okay, so I'm going to go into courses. Uh, I'm going to go into this course this year. Um, and I'm going to just put it here. I'm going to put it outside the uh, repos that we have right now um, in just my practice directory. So you open it here. Don't go ahead. Go ahead and don't select any of these. Uh, you can open it in a new session if you want, but don't select kit repository. We're actually going to talk about this later, uh, but don't select it for now. And you hit create project. It's the last step. And so now what it's doing is open up the project. You can see you have a clear history, a clear environment, and you have a new folder. Um, so if you look here, you can see the new My First Project folder, and it has this uh, myfirstproject.rproj uh, file. So that's gonna keep track of a, a bunch of different things for you, okay? So this is your new project. All right, so that's really great. So now we can create a first R Markdown notebook, which is really, really great too. Um, so again, you're going to go up the same place that we would do a script. You're going to do one more down and select our notebook instead. Okay. Um, what you get is sort of the default untitled notebook template, which is really useful so that you have some stuff to start working with and not just a blank page like a script. But what you want to do sort of immediately is go ahead and save that um, as something uh, so you're going to want to save it in it'll it should automatically put you in my first project go ahead and save it in this folder save all of your project stuff in this folder right because that's going to keep it all together uh, but go ahead um, and name it something uh, my first notebook um, but make sure that it has this rmt uh, file extension okay so there okay so that's good so you've made your first project. You'll notice that you have a notebook, um, which is an HTML notebook, and this uh, RMD file that should pop up there as well. Um, going through this, uh, so the important features here are going to be that our markdown consists of our markdown text, markdown text, which is different than our code, but it also has our code chunks. Okay, so this right here and that right there. All of this stuff and all of this stuff down here, this is all markdown text. This is not our code, okay? It's different than our code. You'll notice that this is in full sentences, okay? That it has some, here's a link and here's, this is an italics little piece and stuff like that, but it's not functions, okay? So this is different than the R code chunk, which appears in this little gray bit right here, okay? So it's really important that um, you remember that writing goes here, R code goes in the gray spot and writing goes here, but R code will not work from markdown. Uh, from markdown. So if we wanna go ahead and preview and see what this is like, you can see that little preview here. I'm going to put it sort of over here that we can see it. Um, OK, so this is the preview of it. And you'll notice this, right? You have to run this chunk in order to see the output there. OK, so you can preview that again. It's going to save it for you. And then the plot shows up right 
right there um, in the context of the thing. But you'll also notice that if you put regular text here um, and try to run that, it's going to give you an error, right? Because this, it wants our code in. Um, but if you put our code up here in the markdown text, you'll also notice that it's going to just write it out for you. It's not going to run it, OK, like this. Um, so it's it's running this and it's 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 printing out the error for you here instead. So we have to run this again to get that output and preview it to get the correct output. OK, so it's really important that you know that you have to have the R code in these code, which is called code chunks, OK, which are going to be gray. We'll tell you how to construct those in just a second. OK. This will produce output, again, that embeds into your document. You have to update this whenever you do it. You can also, if you are if you just you have a bunch of chunks and you can't remember which ones read or run or not, you can click this button and go down to run all, and it'll run all the chunks in that document before you can preview it here. OK, that's so that's really good. Um, and to hit the full, see the full document in HTML, you can hit preview, OK? And that preview button is right there. Um, Markdown text, again, is really simple to update. And I've actually given you in this uh, in this lecture in the notes, you'll see a Markdown um, note that has a lot of these examples for you. So don't worry about writing them down right now. I mean, you can always pause the video, too. But don't worry about writing them down right now. Um, because all of that is given to you in a, as an example. You can link to a website. You can make text italics by, by doing this simple um, uh, two asterisks on either side. OK, and that makes everything inside italics. You can make this bold text. So I'll try to make this bold text here and hit preview. You can see executing is now uh, in bold. Okay, strike through is the double tilde, and again, I'm going to remind you that the tilde is is on the the left, the key left to the one, and you hit shift to get that tilde mark there. So we'll do strike th strike through um, on the word chunk. Okay, and preview that. You can see it strike through right there. Uh, superscript is going to be a, a caret and a two. So let's try to I don't know. Let's try to do like 100 to uh, the second power. OK, and there we go. Um, superscript is going to be two of those tildes. Like double tildes will give you strike through, and one tilde uh, on either side is going to give you. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll do, let's do H2O. That's a good one. H2O, all right, um, is going to give you a subscript right there. So you need to do any chemical formulas. That's how you do it. OK, and headers, you'll notice that we've already got some headers. Uh, this, the title is one header. Um, you can do all sorts of headers that go down from big to small. So big header, uh, smaller, even smaller. <laughs> and then I think four is as small as as small as you can go. Okay, so you'll also notice that you're giving a, a header sort of chunk to that little header as well. So um, it's automatically formatting that for you. Okay, so there's the big header, the smaller, even smaller and smallest one that it'll do. Okay, so those are headers. So anyway, though, though that is all markdown features. Okay, so that's editing that regular text like you would in a GUI. Um, uh, so Microsoft Word or something like that, you would you would highlight it and then go up here and, and do some options. All you're doing here is is just specifying a bit by a couple characters, right? You guys can handle this. This is this is no big deal. Okie dokie. Um, in our code chunks, let's talk about those. So we have this one R code chunk here. We'll get rid of this output really fast. Um, in R code chunks, they begin with this. Uh, three open apostrophes, uh, curly braces, and R. So that's telling Markdown that you're going to format R language text. And again, that open apostrophe, I'll just remind you, is on the same key as the tilde. It's just when you don't shift. OK, that's called an open apostrophe. Um, the one you usually use is called a closed apostrophe. OK, and it ends with three more on the other side of your code, three more of those open apostrophes. And you can see that I can add a new chunk. Um, manually by doing this 
here. So it's turning everything gray and I it's all all of this is gray because I haven't closed that chunk yet. Um, so I'll do print the letter 10. Okay. And close it by doing three more of those open apostrophes. All right, so some super simple. Um, you can hit this, you know, get output, uh, run the code by doing this little green play button here. This one will actually run all of the chunks of code that are above this code, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but you can also get different code options for running this chunk um, here. So you can uh, show output only, show code and output, okay. Um, uh, show nothing or show nothing and don't run the code, run code and don't run code. And they they actually give you all of these things right here that you'll do. You can also show warnings or not, okay? Uh, show messages or not, uh, use printed pages or not. Okay, so this is giving you all of the different options that you can have for actually, you know, rendering that code chunk within your document, okay? Uh, the field, again, if this field isn't gray, uh, it's not paying attention to that code. It's not running it as R code. So you need to have your R code in those chunks in order for it to render properly. Okay, and don't have text in those chunks because it's not going to understand that. <laughs> different environments there. From now on, I want you to work in these R markdown documents. Why? Because you're at, able to add a lot of context um, to the code itself. Uh, so that we're starting right away with that letter of programming instead of uh, struggling um, through doing a script and then having to write it up separately. Here you're writing it up and doing that script at the same time. It's much easier actually than giving comments. I've had you turning in scripts with like little comments to say which question. Now you can do it in the actual text, which is kind of a lot nicer, right? Okay, so check your understanding. Uh, I want you in your basic R Markdown notebook, add a header, some text, and a new chunk with a bit of code. It really doesn't matter what the code is, okay? And try pre previewing it in that document. All right, so I want you to do that separately. Try to do something other than print, right? I've shown you how to do this already, but go ahead and do a different code chunk here. So I'll give you a second here to pause. I really want you to pause, catch up on this because we're gonna go on to something different here right after the break. Okay, so hopefully you've done that check your understanding. We are moving on because it's not just about literate programming, it's also about starting this data analysis. And in order to start exploratory data analysis, what you really need to know right off the bat is how to plot things because a lot of what exploratory data analysis is, like we talked about last time, or we talked about in class um, in 2.1, is really just seeing uh, what the data are in the relationship to other parts of the, that data set, okay? So we're going to start on basic plotting. Uh, for this basic plotting, I am going to go ahead and use my um, R, uh, my R uh, markdown folder for the notebook for this class. So this is going to open up this notebook. You have this notebook as well, so you can hopefully preview that and get all of the output for it. Um, it also goes through this formatting markdown text, um, making an ordered list, an unordered list, uh, doing these paragraphs, which just means to have a full, full uh, blank line in between stuff, the headers, um, and a, a link to a good helpful cheat sheet there. Uh, also, the code chunk options, it goes through a lot of just sort of basic code chunk options and kind of what the outputs are and what they mean. If I want to go ahead and run all of these chunks, I'm going to have to wait until it's done. And then I can preview this to get to see what all of those different options mean, um, just as a, uh, sorry, I have a hair in my eye, which is really bothering me. <laughs> which uh, gives you all of the, the sort of examples of, of what happens with, with each of those things. But here we'll, we'll start on the basic plotting stuff right now. Okay, so I'm gonna have this basic plotting. Oh, this is really too big. Let me make that smaller. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start on this basic plotting and all of the code that I'm gonna have in this thing, uh, in the slides today are actually going to be in this basic plotting document as well. So check out the basic, uh, basic plotting document and you can run these chunks of code as we go through them. Okay, so basic plotting. R is a really popular language because of how easy it is to produce high quality uh, production or um, publication ready plots. Uh, so we're going to start off by using that basic plot command, and we're going to construct our own plots here. 
uh, by just uh, assigning two vectors. Um, you'll notice that these vectors need to be the same length, okay, because it won't plot two vectors that have different lengths. Um, and just saying plot. In the plot command, you can specify the x and the y values. You can also specify these in lazy uh, evaluation by just saying x values first and y values second. You don't actually have to say y equals or x equals, but I've done it throughout this document just for clarity purposes. Okay, so this is what you get. Um, the basic plot is pretty nice. It has some defaults. It will default the limits for you in this plot, the X and Y limits. It'll also default those uh, labels, the access labels, with whatever the name of that, um, whatever the name of that vector is that you're trying to plot. Okay, uh, you can also use it. Um, a basic uh, plot with a data frame command. So if you want to look here, I'm going to get rid of this output really fast. Uh, if you want to run this code chunk, it basically is the same thing. It's taking these two things. It's stitching both of those into a data frame um, with X and Y values here. And then it's plotting using a formula. So formulas are uh, specific uh, uh, constructions. Um, it's a data class that we haven't talked about yet, but it's really, really useful. So this is Y tilde X, which is Y against X. Um, and then you specify the data equals data frame. So this only works with data frames, okay? And the, the columns have to be named um, such that you could pull them up with a dollar sign. Okay, so uh, X versus Y in this data frame um, will get you the same plot. You'll notice that the defaults here, uh, the default labels are different, and that's the only thing that's different about this specific plot. Okay, so basic plotting is really easy. You can do it two ways. Just remember that there's often multiple ways of doing the same exact thing in R in most coding languages. Um, Unless you start really talking about optimization, you don't need to worry about stuff like that for now, okay? So let's talk about tax, uh, labels and axes. So if you scroll down, you'll see labels and axes here pop up. Um, you can add additional arguments within plot. Remember, we have two arguments right now that are, are uh, required at least. Um, either a formula in that data set that you're using or X and Y values for those vectors. Okay, so additional um, arguments that you can put directly into that plot uh, function are the X label, uh, so your X axis label, the, um, uh, oh, also I'll uh, just mention that uh, you can do this as one big giant line of code okay with no spaces or anything like that and i can show you how that is and it's wrapping the text here in our markdown but it gets a little bit confusing to read because you really have to read down right around here but what you can do is it, after any comma um you can hit enter and it's going to line it up with whatever uh function um or the end of an argument that you have so this is, uh, ends up being really really useful in terms of just you know, indenting stuff so it, it makes it, it easier for you to read and easier for the user to read. So I encourage you to uh, break those commands up. Again, most of these commands, if you're using the equal sign, um, are going to, uh, it doesn't matter what order they are as long as you're specifying which argument you're trying to make in there. Um, but you can uh, do the x-axis label, the y-axis label, and the main plot title, which is like the thing that goes across the top, okay? It's, it's not title, it's main um, is the argument there. Okay, so axis limits. Um, axis limits, are, again, are very easy. Uh, they are just an extra uh, argument within, um, within the plot function. So y limit uh, will, uh, is it, the, the trick here, it needs to be a vector of length two, okay? So a vector, so you have to use that C to stitch both of those, uh, uh, the, the lower limit, which is the first one, and the upper limit, which is the second one. You need a C to, to stitch that into a vector, um, and these need to be specified separately if you're doing it within plot. There is actually a limits function that you can do it separately, but we're not going to cover it here today. You can Google that if you want. Um, but see here, I've done the limits here as negative five and negative uh, uh, negative five and 30 for the X. So it's extending this out to negative five and then extending that out to 30. And then for the Y limit, I'm extending it down to negative 50 and up to uh, 150. So if you look at the default set limits, it's really tight against the points, but if you'd like some extra space there for whatever reason, 
um, it's really quite easy to set that. So that's axis limits. Okay, I'd like you to check your understanding at this point. This, this, by the way, is not in the documentation or this documentation. I'd like you to add it to this documentation or notes for this class. And by the way, you can be writing any notes that you want in the markdown section of this text. So you don't have to keep a separate notebook or write them down um, separately. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is make a plot of vapor pressure in millimeters of mercury versus temperature in C of mercury using the pressure data set. Now the pressure data set does contain both of those things. It contains only those things in fact, but I want you to set the axis labels to this information, not just what it's plotting, but also the units it's plotting in and the title of this graph. Um, I'd also like you to separately make the same plot using a different method. So maybe with or without using a formula, depending on how you did the first plot. Okay, so to take a quick break, uh, go ahead and pause the video and do that. Okay, so hopefully you've had some success doing that with the pressure data set and we can move on. So formatting plots. So this is more about formatting what the plot looks like as opposed to the, the, the um, other parts of the plot. Uh, and you can continue to do this. A lot of attributes um, of these plots can be uh, uh, included directly in plot, uh, the plot command using different arguments uh, yet again. All right, so more arguments we have here. Um, you can uh, uh, specify the plot type. So L, P, or B are the um, are the uh, possible arguments here. It stands for lines, points, or both lines and points. Um, this, you know, just use what you like. Uh, I actually like to plot the line. If I want both, I like to plot the lines and the points separately because it looks a little bit different. I like it better, but you can also do it um, natively in, in one plot command here. You can set the color versus uh, using CL, COL, okay, and most colors, this needs to be a character argument, so you need to put it in quotes, right, if you just do red, it's not going to understand that, but if you do quote, quote, red, uh, and make it a character, it does understand, most basic colors are going to be valid, like if you do like uh, uh, dusky night as a color, like maybe that is a, a pink color, but it's not going to know what that is, okay, but like red, orange, yellow, blue, it's going to know those types of things, and you can also Google our base colors um, to get a complete list. There are actually quite a, a number of colors that you can get. Um, go ahead and Google that. I'm not going to cover that. You can also, um, if you're using points, you can specify the shape of that point using P PCH, uh, and then um, the there's, uh, a, there's actually a bunch of characters you can set using the quotes. Um, so making it a character, you can set that as the point itself, but there's also integer numeric combinations that you can use. And this is what they stand for in this little chart. Um, uh, hilariously, people have me, well, like, what would I actually get tattooed on my body? And it would be like the PCH shapes, points, colors. So I can look at it when the internet is the internet is down and I can't Google to um, find that. But if you, it, it turns out if you Google that, you can, you can pull that back up. Often the ones I use are like 19 and 21. So the difference here between these solid color shape is this is going to be the color. And then this will actually be, the color is going to be the outline. And then you can set the inside fill color as different. Okay, so those are uh, those arguments. So I have an example here of just turning that line red um, right there. Okay, so color can actually be assigned based on factors as well. So we're using the iris color, uh, the iris data set here, and you'll notice that I uh, specify um, the three colors because there are three species. That's what I want it colored by. So I plot petal length versus petal width here, okay, on my on my plot, and then I'll drag this down so you can see it a little bit better. Here we go. Um, and then what I do is uh, use an argument for color that is the iris color, so the colors that you have up here. Um, and then I'm going to reference um, the iris species. So if you'll know, if you notice, if you want to view iris, uh, the iris data set, you'll see that species is down here. If you want to summary this, it is often a really quick way of trying to decide what data class it is. Um, and you can see that factors are, are are down here. So this is a factor data set. And so what it's going to do is one, two, and three. And so it's going to reference one, two, or three within this data color set. You can, of course, change this to whatever colors you like. Uh, I use red, blue, and black because those are nice um, uh, color data friendly. Using the point round uh, solid fill here and uh, a type point. 
um, there. So that's a good um, uh, uh, a good way of referencing those color values based on factor values. Um, you can find the number of levels in a factor by uh, saying in levels, which is a command that we're, we're going to cover in a little bit when we do factors. Um, but iris species hit that and it says three. So just, just know that you need at least three, one, two, three uh, 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 spots in your, in your iris colors vector for that, um, because that corresponds with the number of species there, right? So pretty, pretty re reasonable. I mean, you can also do this with, with, uh, you can also do this with point shape. <gasps> so um, your next check your understanding is make a plot of circumference versus age for orange trees in the data set orange. Um, I want you to give the tree a unique color and a point shape. Okay, so figure out how to do that. So make a new chunk in your little notebook for your check your understanding. And you're going to not only alter the color here, but you're also going to alter the point shape based on the tree, uh, the specific tree in orange. Okay. So I'm gonna give you a pause. Go ahead and pause it, work it out, come back. Okay, so hopefully you're back. You've done this successfully. It's not that too bad, but it's it's you know it's a little bit more work than than you might uh, be used to doing for these check your understandings. That's good. We're starting to build, we're starting to like put these concepts together and, and the learning objectives together because you're starting to be a little bit more um, uh, more skilled of a programmer. Okay, so basic plotting, adding things to existing plots. So this is a really interesting, uh, an interesting example. I have two examples for you here. Uh, one is this chick, chick weight. Uh, it's a plot based on the chick weight data set um, and two subsets. So what I'm doing, first of all, is I'm breaking, there's two diets that they feed the chicks and they collect some stuff, including the time. So they do a, a time series of this and the weight of the chick. So I'm plotting time versus, or weight versus time here, but I'm breaking it up and subsetting that data. So I'm only getting the, the diet one chicks in uh, the first plot and then the diet two chicks in the second plot. Okay, so what I'm doing is adding this as that solid round PCH. Okay, so solid round dots. And then I'm adding to that using the points command. So it's a separate function that will add to, um, to uh, an existing plot. And when I do this, um, I can uh, uh, plot that diet too. So it's, it's, it's weight versus time again, um, but it's diet too. And I'm using a star here uh, instead. So you can see the stars there. And uh, I'm also coloring it by chick. So it's all this like mess of default colors, which is ugly, but that's fine because it's a, a pretty simple example. Okay, so that's one example. And the second example I have is plotting Y values in, uh, with lines and points and then adding bounded lines to the x axis. So I'm thinking of like you have this data set, you want to know which you want to visualize which points fall in a region. And so you want to, you know, just make the region be those dotted lines above and below. So I have a sequence of x values, um, one to 10 by 0.1. And then I just say, okay, I want you to uh, produce random numbers. Um, a, a vector of random numbers in the same length as the x values, right? Tying them together in a data frame so that they're x and y. Um, I'm plotting first the x and y as a line. So it's the black line comes up first. Um, then the points come up first and I'm using 10, which is a little uh, 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 circle with a, a uh, across in the middle of it. And then, so that's the first addition are these blue blue points there. And then the lines, I'm adding uh, an upper line, which is dotted. And this is the line type three. So you can change these line types um, based, on, uh, based on what number it is. So there's two and there's three here. So the upper line is gonna be at 0.65 and the lower line is gonna be at 0.35. And so this is how you would do it, plot it totally across um, the line like this. Okay, so that's just adding points and lines to an existing plot. If you try to call these as plot again and again, um, it will make separate plots for you, which is not always helpful if you want it on the same plot, right? Um, if you try, but the arguments with plot for plot and these points and lines are slightly different. So you can't, for line, you can't use this line type. You may be able to use line type, but if you, if you do type as line, it's going to 
it's not going to like that because that's not an argument for the lines or the points uh, function. Okay, so just be a little bit careful there. There are some differences, especially if you want to fill in these points between plot and lines. I believe that they are different uh, or they behave differently. Okay, so just be be careful there when you're when you're doing that stuff. But that's how to add arrows is another function that's pretty useful, but I'm not going to cover it here. Um, you can do like vector arrows and stuff like that. It's it's kind of cool. Um, but again, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to cover it here. So adding a legend is the last thing I think we're going to add here. So we're going to go back to our iris colors plot um, where we colored the um, different species, red, blue, and black, and add a legend to the top of this. So uh, the first thing you have to specify is the placement, and the options are top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left, or center. And that's just going to be uh, the quarters or the center of where this legend shows up. Um, you have to specify the legend. So this is going to be the text of what's going to show up by those points. Um, and then specify anything else that varies. OK, so you have to specify like what colors. Again, this is going to be the iris colors and the PCH, so it's going to be the shape of those things that change. Um, just be careful if you vary uh, the color and the shape, you have to vary both of those as well, um, right? So that's uh, that's an important thing to, to notice. Um, the legend here in base plot is really, really clunky, and um, ggplot2, which we're going to get to a little bit later, we're not going to do it this time, but a little bit later, um, is, is much more elegant in terms of, of this plot, but there are a lot more options for legend that you can look up as well. Um, so for your last check your understanding, I want you to go ahead and add the legend to that graph of orange trees that we did in the past one. Um, and that will be a good way of sort of orienting you to adding a legend to your plots. OK, so go ahead and do that um, in terms of uh, but that's the end of the, the time for today. I'd like you to complete that assignment 2.1 using um, R markdown. Again, you're going to turn in that RMD file extension there. Uh, and then also read Davies chapter eight and Chang's chapter one through two for next time. We're going to talk about uh, reading, loading in data, reading it, and uh, cleaning data sets um, in our markdown. So that's great. But that's it for me today. So keep on coding. I'll see you later.